be here. And like I say, it was, anyway, I don't want to rehearse all that. I want to call your attention to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 tonight. And I want to say something before I read the text. No, I think I'll read the text and then they say this something. I'll give you a chance to get there. But I appreciate all the, uh, well, the good spirit in the service and the good singing and uh, the last song we just did really, it, it really blessed my heart big time. And I'll tell you in just a moment why that is. Second Samuel chapter number six. And we'll start in verse number six. And when they came to Nacor's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but uh, David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And we'll stop there. Now, Lord, we thank you for your good presence, and we worship and adore you. I pray the grace of God will be richly bestowed upon this evening service. May God's word take a hold of our lives and be effectual, accomplishing your pleasure. I pray you'd bless the dear saints of God, and may they be built up in the most holy faith. If there's one wayward soul to a work in their life tonight, Pray you bless this great ministry. I was blessed at the missionary letters read earlier. Lord, you know that's a big thing in my life. Pray for mission works around the world. And dear God, it really touched my heart, these letters tonight. And I thank you for those good reports. And bless these uh, ministries that were mentioned in those letters. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, there's one outstanding theme in these verses tonight. Concerning Obed-Edom, it says that, and I don't want to get into a lot of the background, I could, but Obed-Edom, in essence, he took the ark of God into his home. Obed-Edom was witness to the severity of God as far as, uh, you know, he, was, he saw um, the slaughter that the ark had made among the Philistines you know, had gone from one place, the Philistines, to another, and great slaughter from God had befell those areas until it was brought back to its rightful place. And it says the, Phil okay, and he saw Uzzah struck dead just moments before. Yeah. He, he saw, man, hey, it could be a dangerous thing. Yeah. Uh, here he's inviting God's ark into his house after all the devastation on the Philistines and then I witnessed to us of being slain. He says, but I want the ark. And as a result, and, and this ark stayed in his house for three months, by the way, uh, was a preacher some years back, Brother Bill South. He preached on a message, 90 days in the presence of God. And so that's, but anyway, it, the uh, thing I want to really get to tonight is it says the Lord blessed Obed-Edom, and all his household. Matter of fact, it is said twice that God blessed Obed-Edom and his house, 
And it was told in verse 12, King David saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom. You know when God blesses your home, word gets around. I mean, brother, it will be manifest. It will be very obvious. And well, let me get, I'm going to lead up this song in just a moment. Nothing about the lyrics so much, but, but it was 42 years ago in Fort Pierce, Florida that me and my baby doll back there was brought together in holy matrimony on a Sunday afternoon. And um, well, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was pastoring in a little place called Winter Beach. Don't tell me if that was right or wrong. It's just what it was, okay? I didn't preach that morning. I had the visiting preacher to, amen? And we had the wedding at 3 o'clock, left the wedding. It was a big old wedding because people couldn't believe she'd marry me. <clears throat> and um, it was actually a double wedding. Her brother and uh, his wife were married in the same ceremony. We left there and went straight to the hospital in Vero Beach. Now, honestly, that sounds like I'm frivolous, but that's the truth because her mother was, she had a lot of health issues and was in the hospital, so we went straight to visit her. We left there and went straight to Yeehaw Junction. Anybody know where that is? Yeehaw Junction, Florida. And uh, they only had one caution light, still do just have one caution light. And back then, they don't have it anymore. They had a motel, Holiday Inn, and that was where we're going to spend our night, which of course we did. But let me tell you this, before we went to the motel, we went to the house of God. We happened to be Christian people. We went to church, and then we went and checked in, when we checked in and got our things into the room, the first thing we did was kneel down by the, ba- by the bedside, both of us. And in essence, we prayed, God bless our home. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise and there's some more background when I was a kid about that, but, but, but this uh, will do for now. Well, let me say God has, preacher. God has blessed our home. But you say, how does that song fit in? That was one of the wedding songs. I, I, we seldom hear that. That's a rare song in, in the Baptist church, That's Independent awesome. Baptist. But you sang it tonight, and man, wow. I said, wow, man, that's a confirmation. And you know, the, the Savior, like a shepherd, has led us. God has powerfully blessed our home. And... Um, in way of introduction, a verse I'm going to give quick reference to is in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. It says, The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, semicolon, or is it a colon? Yeah, colon. But he blesseth the house or the habitation of the just. Yeah. There's a contrast in that verse, which is typical in Proverbs. And everybody can find their home in Proverbs 33, uh, 333, either on A side or B side. I hope yours is on B side tonight. That's right. yeah. The Lord hath blessed your habitation. If you're on the A side, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay on the, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. You don't have to stay in that category. Another introduction thought, there's three blessings I'm going to give you quickly. God's first blessing mentioned in Scripture was in Genesis 1.22, God blessed them. His blessing was upon the home. His first blessing was upon the home. Yes. The first institution that God established on the face of this earth was the home. So I'll say three blessings, three firsts what I meant to say. The first blessing, the first institution. And you come to the New Testament, His first miracle yes. was in the home. And let me tell you what, it takes a miracle. It takes a miracle in your home for two people to learn how to be one and to have a home where Jesus lives. Amen. Now, now, I would ask a question. Do you want God to bless your home? It's so easy to say, well, sure. Are you really sure? Because we're going to get into what does it mean? What does it mean? You want God to bless your home? That doesn't mean you're going to have a fancy this or fancy that and and so forth. But there's some things about the blessing of the home. Number one, 
If you want God's blessing, it means you want God's power on your home. I use the word power in the sense of authority. Amen? The sense of authority. We did not raise our children by Dr. Spock. We did not raise our children by Hollywood standards. We did not raise our children according to the whims of society. We did not raise our children according to the dictates of even family members. We raised our children on the premises and the foundation of this Holy Bible. Not just raising children, our whole household was established upon how firm a foundation. Brother, I'm going to tell you what, and our children, by the way, still love God and serve God. Hey, I'm telling you what, God's been good to us. We're happy in Jesus tonight, and God continues to bless our home. Me and my baby doll, we still have a spell together in our home. Amen. We pray and sing and read scripture morning by morning together. We go forth together. Well, God put us together. We've stayed together. We're going on together because God has blessed. But the word power in terms of authority. Hey, brother, he's to be the head. And I know the man is the head of the house, but in one sense, God is to be the supreme head and ruler. You're to run your home according to this standard, God's holy word. And so uh, 2 Kings 20, it says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now that's something we all need to consider. Right. Is your house in order? Is it in order according? You know, parents, and I know most of us are grandparents by now, a lot of grandparents. And but you know, you you start. You need to study the Bible on how to have a home. Yeah. You need to really start digging and praying. And by the way, our home had an atmosphere of prayer and holy music. We never had a television in our home. We never had devil music in our home. Amen. That's good, preacher. Amen. I don't... Anyway, let me get on some more of this. Uh, Many homes are out of order. Uh, One writer said, when the home is ruled according to God's word, angels might be asked to stay a night there and they would not find themselves out of their element in the least. They'd feel right at home. Let me ask you this. Does the Lord feel at home in your home? Amen. Uh, And, uh, you know, Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer that God not only wanted to save him, but his house. And the Lord wants to live in your home tonight. And his will be done. That to have God's authority means God's word to rule the order of the home and the training, uh, the rearing up of your children. It means to have a good church. Let me tell you something. Every man needs three homes. Every man needs three homes. Number one, a home in heaven to know you're born again, washed in the blood. Number two, a home where you're raising children or if, if you're, your children's already gone, you still need a home where Jesus lives in your home, a Christian home. Yeah. Number three, a church home, church home. Uh, where, where they preach the King James Bible yeah. and have the old time preaching, praying, singing, shouting, not contemporary. Mm, I feel a mean streak about to hit me. Amen. Um, number two, to have God's blessing on your home, not only power, but the peace of God. I think it's quite interesting that when the Lord sent forth his disciples in Matthew 10 and Luke 10, both chapters deal with this, but I'm going to especially look at Luke 10, and he gives them instruction, and it's you know, very early on, matter of fact, the very outset of his instruction where he says, into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. That would indicate that God is really desirous that his peace would be in your home. The first thing, he says, the first thing I want you to do is get God's peace bestowed. Now, is that with you tonight? 
So many homes are filled with violence, with the very fumes of hell, fussing, fighting, fuming, arguing, and even physical violence, which is terrible, but it's just so many homes are characterized by that. No peace in the home because of a wildness in the atmosphere. You're raising brats instead of children. It's not right for any child to be a spoiled brat. Amen? Come on, come on, talk to me. And then there's wild music. Go ahead and look at me. Wild music. Do I need to define that? Anything that doesn't honor Christ in your home is music that you know, would be adverse and would be uh, very detrimental to your spiritual well-being. You say, well, there's nothing wrong with this music, that music. Well, let me ask you what's right about it. Does it glorify God? Does it minister blessing and sweetness to your inner being? Does it, is it conducive to your walk with God? So much music is to the very contrary. They incite rebellion and and uh, promiscuity and so forth, a life of drink and carousing. Uh, no peace in your home because of the wild music, the atmosphere, the drugs. Of course, I raised my kids on drugs. I drug them to church. I drug them behind the woodshed. <clears throat> no peace in your home because of the kind of programs you watch, the kind of websites that you uh, have. Maybe because of alcohol. You say, well, I don't see anything wrong with a you know, little toddy for the body. Well, that's the reason your home's messed up. And so, um, you know, you read more about kids committing suicide in this day than ever before. I just, the other day, read about an eight-year-old <clears throat> who committed suicide. A 10-year-old was on the verge of committing suicide, and we prayed for the child named Cody. And um, I'm glad he hasn't done so, but... 12, 13-year-olds, you just hear it just so often. Why? There's no peace in the home. If there's no peace in the home, there's no peace in the bosoms of those children. Those children, uh, you know, I know they should be in a Christian school and all that, but the real hope of that child is a Christian home where they can come home from whatever environment they have and find that God is still in my home. Mama, you know, there's a song I should have done it tonight that says there's a family Bible on the table. Its pages are worn and hard to read, but the family Bible on the table will ever be my key to memory. I can see us sitting around the table as from the family Bible, dad would read, and I can hear my mama softly singing, Rock of Ages, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. And that's just a description of the sweet atmosphere of a Christian home. And then number three, do you want God's blessing? Do you want God's blessing on your home? Well, let me tell you what, there needs to be prayers. And I don't mean just formal, you know, well, it's, it's got to be more than just a ritual. It's got to be reality. Some fervent, heartfelt praying, real, genuine, earnest praying. Uh, praying, uh, it should never surprise one of your children to find you on your knees in prayer. Yes. It should not shock them. It should be regular. Well, daddy's praying again. Mama's praying again. I'll leave them alone. This should not, uh, you know, a lot of kids, if they saw you on your knees praying, oh no, what's the matter? Something must be terribly wrong. It should just be common knowledge. My mama loves God. My mama prays. My mama's reading the Bible. She does that all the time. She doesn't uh, browse through all this other kind of material. She loves God's Word. She reads the Bible. My mama's a praying mama. Used two songs were written to that effect. Uh, one of them says, if I could only hear my mama pray again. And many songs, many songs about mama's prayers and a song about daddy's table grace. Uh, the, the song we used to sing when I was a teenager in some gospel group, uh, uh, da da Father's Table Grace. But anyway, mamas and daddies, it should not shock your child, your daddy, to see you on your knees. Grandpa, grandma, to see you on your knees. Of course, if you're too feeble to get on your knees, it should not shock them to see mamas, grandmas praying, grandpas praying. They ought to even hear the sweet sounds of prayers coming from 
you know, your bedroom or wherever. That's right. You don't have to call for a formal setting of prayer. It's good to have group praying, family praying. We always did that. But brother, you need to have individual praying. Yeah. One uh, is a song or a poem, might be both, that says, the family who prays together stays together. Um, I, When I was raising little guys, well, I always prayed with them before bedtime and go into the bedroom, and, and I would um, have them all three together, and I'd say, okay, Stephen, you start out in prayer, and then Christian and Rebecca, the, the age frame. But one, sometime or another, I mean, just from time to time, one of them would say, Dad, I don't feel like praying. I never forced it. I never put a guilt trip on them. I said, okay, go on to the next one. You know, you cannot cram religion down a child's throat. But they need to see a mama that walks with God, a daddy that walks with God. Not just rules and regulations and we don't do this, we don't go there. Praying, and so my children were never amazed to see miracles. I mean, it was just common. We would, they'd be sick and, and we've prayed. And I'm not against going to the doctor. I've taken them there before, but we've seen God touch their sick bodies a lot of times. And then there's a verse in the Bible that says, laugh or doeth good like a medicine. I'd go in there and say, are you going to laugh or I'm going to whoop you? <laughs> and so that's saved me a lot of doctor bills there. And they're used to us praying for needs and, you know, uh, this need, that need, a lot of serious needs and praying for wisdom, for decision. We prayed as a family one solid year as a family in agreement before we resigned our last church and went on the road. And that's been 25 years ago. And we saw God open doors and, and pray for the future of your children. Pray for their marriages and so forth. Okay, let me think now. I've got um, one and a half points left. Okay, that's not bad, is it? That's good. <clears throat> of course, the half point may be that long. <laughs> But uh, uh, a home where praises, there, there should be praises. You know, so many Christian homes are negative-based. You know, we, and they, they sort of grim and boring and dull and deadbeat homes. It's a dangerous thing to have a Christian home with no joy. That will cause uh, an effect on your children uh, to reverse what you really want. If they don't have any joy, if they don't see any joy demonstrated in mom and daddy, they're really questioning. You come to church and you sing victory in Jesus, but you don't live it. You sing it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, but where is it? It's like Galatians 4.14. Where is the blessedness that you spake of? We got a lot of doctrine, but not much living. And so these children, they need to see some genuine praise in your home. And I'm talking about praise in a number of ways. Of course, praise to the Almighty. And again, that's not a formal thing. Well, it's time to say amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. No, no, no. It's got to be more genuine and, and um, just spontaneous. Um, so there was a time, more than one time, when my children traveled with me and sang with me. Uh, sometimes somebody kind of say, Brother Weaver, how did you get your children to sing with you? Oh, it was easy. I put a chain and a padlock on the refrigerator and I said, if you don't sing, you don't eat. <laughs> but in all honesty, I never tried to get them to sing. But I sang because there's a song in my life. Yeah, I would get my guitar out, I'd start singing and the, and the children would come around and they'd just join in with me. But I never made them do it. They did it because it was there. It was there. Amen. And there was worship. You need worship in your home. Don't wait you go to church to worship God. Let worship be a major factor in your home. Practice the presence of God in your home. Praise, praise, praise to the Almighty. And it does good to even praise one another in, uh, in that respect. Not like you do God, of course, but you know, your children can be bragged on. You don't have to whoop them about everything. Yeah. And it's always, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. Well, think of something they did do right. Amen. And praise your wife. Man, I'm bragging my wife. Man, she's one of the greatest cooks there ever is was. Amen. <clears throat> I mean, I tried out all kind of girlfriends before I found a good cook. <laughs> <clears throat> 
And I could tell you a cute story about that, but I want to move on. Praise. Uh, and she's a powerful cook, I tell you that. Now, you know, there is, uh, you know, some qualifications of a preacher's wife. You find in Second Weaver, chapter 3, uh, got to... Got to be able to fry chicken and make make homemade biscuits and sawmill gravy and so forth. You have to read that chapter sometime. <clears throat> Qualifications of a preacher's wife. Um, Psalm seventy eight, um, yeah, seventy eight, verse four. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength. Notice the continuity. I'm going to show the praises of God. And his strength. You see, strength follows the praises. I've seen God do major miracles. And I could name them to you when I praised God in severe adverse conditions. And I saw God come through in, well, I I can't get into all that right now. But brother, it's just a wonderful thing. Okay, to show the generation to come the praises of the Lord, his strength, his wonderful works. That he hath done. Okay. I'm making sure I got all this in there. I think I'll get on my, to my last point. Do you want God's blessing? The presence. And that goes right back to our text. The ark represented God's presence. Obedidim says, I want his presence. In my home. I want his presence. I really charge you tonight. To have the presence of God. Not only in your heart. But in your home. I would charge you. No matter what age of a family you have. The seniors. The younger parents. To go home and get revival. In your home. Tonight. Make the presence of God a divine reality. It can't be worked up. It's not imaginary. It's very genuine, very serious, and very beautiful. Don't leave Him at church. That's my message tonight. Oh God, that You'd bless now as we prepare for this invitation service. Thank You for this great man of God. I'm honored. Or to be with the baker and his dear people. Thank you for how they've been a blessing to us. Bless this altar, the music, this service. In Christ's name, amen. That's good. All right, let's stand to our feet. No matter how, no matter how good your home is, it'll always do some help. No matter how good your marriage is, you always need some help. What you heard tonight is help. I can help your marriage and help your home. His presence in your life will make the difference in His presence in your home. I was writing some stuff for the bulletin that'll come out Sunday, a church bulletin. It has to do with Jesus in your home. If he were to visit, you say, well, as long as he stayed a few days, I can handle it. What if he just moved in? Well, if you're saved, he moved in. He's in your life. How much of Him are you letting Him to have His way? Hmm. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Trying to please Him in all that I say and do. Yielding allegiance. Wow. Amen, amen.
Well, wasn't that a great message? Amen. You know, I, I found this out many, many years ago, not just tonight, but uh, it just seems like it doesn't matter how, how, how well I think my marriage is. You hear something like that, you realize it ain't, it ain't, it ain't, you ain't what you think you are in your marriage. Then you, you think your prayer life's okay. Then you go hear somebody like John R. Rice or Benny Beckham preach on prayer. You realize your prayer life's got a long ways to go. Then you think you're living real good and straight. Then you hear somebody preach on godly separation. You realize you're in the straight you think you are. Point is, uh, we need we need help every time we come to church, don't we? Every day we need some help. Especially just when you think you're a good witness, you find out you're not as good as witness you think you are. Point is, he's still working on us. Amen. He's still the potter and we're still the clay. And he's wanting to mold us and make us. Get out of us those things that, that was, is not needed and put in us the shape and the form that he has not in his mind. Thank you, Brother Weaver. That's a great message tonight. Sure helped me, encouraged me. I wish Miss Baker was here to hear it too. Amen. And uh, uh, when, when you get home, she'll say, what did he preach on? I said, preached on a marriage. She'll say, I wish I could have heard it. I want to say, I wish he could have too. But here's the point about it. I, I say that in jest. But sometimes you hear a preacher preach, you think about somebody who's not there. You say, well, I wish they was in here. I wish they was here. Well, they're not, but you are. And so it's you that needed that message, not so much them. Okay. All right. Well, praise the Lord. And I hope you'll be careful going home tonight. Don't forget now. I hope you'll, if you possibly can, get over to the Victor Baptist Church on, on Friday or Saturday night or both nights at 7 o'clock. And they've got a young evangelist over there. I can't remember his name. Is it? What now? Chris Hewitt. Chris Hewitt. And uh, he's a fairly young fellow, I think he said. And uh, so 7 o'clock, if you can't get over, uh, you'll hear some, have some good singing, good fellowship, and good preaching if you can get over there. Okay? All right. I think that's it. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we sure thank you now for what we've heard tonight. God, it really spoke to my heart. And Lord, encouraged me to be what I need to be day in and day out. And Lord, I pray that you'll, you'll bless uh, Brother Weaver and his dear wife as they continue, dear God, to serve you up and down the East Coast, Midwest, out West, dear God, that everywhere they travel, Lord, you meet every need they have and protect them. Watch over his kids and grandkids, dear Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.